Welcome to Rearranging Change, how you market to an ever-changing world. I'm your host, Steve McChesney. Hello and welcome to episode number four. And we are continuing with the fourth of our five-week series on the generations and how we market to them. And today we're going to talk about the millennials. Now, millennials are Generation Y, were born between 1981 and 1996, and they're currently in their 20s to mid-30s right now. And I must say that uh, I have three daughters who all three fall into this category, so I know it pretty well. Now, they got their name from a 1991 book. It was called Generations, the History of America's Future. They're also the most educated generation. Millennials went to college. Now, they went to college with the promise of a job when they got out, and that promise wasn't kept. So a lot of millennials had to move back in with mom and dad. In fact, today, a lot of millennials are still on mom and dad's wallet, but they are educated. Only the baby boomers rival the size of this generation. This means that this generation is going to be making a huge impact on society moving forward. They are the second largest generation entering the workforce behind the baby boomers. As marketers, we must pay attention and we must listen to them. Millennials do like instant gratification, so make sure that what you offer them has an immediate result. There are more Google searches on millennials than any other generation. Now, I believe that's because people, companies, and marketers are trying to understand them and learn how to communicate with them. They typically are children of a divorce. They grew up more sheltered than any other generation. Now, parents would try and shield them from the evils of the world. Unfortunately, the evils of the world made themselves visible to this generation in a big way. Because of that, Millennials hope to be the next great generation and turn around the wrongs of today. Think about it. Baby boomers mostly run the U.S. government. Rules and laws are passed on their values and beliefs. The reality of it is that they are near the end of their reign. They're retiring. They're dying. They're being replaced. The millennials will be the ones replacing them. Why? Because they're educated. In this country, you must be 35 to run for president of the United States. The oldest millennial right now is 35. This is good news. Some of the greatest characteristics of millennials are that they're very tolerant. They're inclusive. They're spiritual. They're extremely techno-savvy. They consider themselves as members of a global community. They're concerned with the environment and the future of our planet. Millennials don't care about the color of someone's skin, their religious beliefs, or their sexual orientation. They do care about the political beliefs of others, so tread lightly in that area when you're talking to them. Now think about that. Millennials will be the ones to take over Congress. They're going to be the ones to take over the power, and and they're going to run the world. And I believe that that's good news for us because they are so tolerant. But they're also tolerant of other countries and their beliefs. I think that's going to be a more peaceful world. That's just my personal belief, so we'll see what happens on that. Uh, By the way, millennials, they have not lived without computers. Their preferred style of communication is texting, although this may change with time as technology changes. Although they may have huge student debt, they have no problem spending money. Financing is a word that is in their vocabulary. Some of the events that helped shape their lives include in 1995, the bombing of Oklahoma Federal Building. In 1995, we had the O.J. Simpson trial. In 1999, the Columbine High School shooting. 2001, 9-11 terrorism attack in New York City. Boy, is there any wonder why they want to change the world. In 2003, MySpace launched. 2004, Facebook launches. In 2006, Twitter launches. 2008, we had the election of Barack Obama. And in 2008, we also had the crash of Wall Street. That crash of Wall Street was not as detrimental as the one in 1929. In 1929, the whole society was affected by that stock market crash. This time, it was mostly the baby boomers who were affected. They lost a lot of their 401ks and their investments in the stock market and things like that. That's why they're still working, as we talked about during the baby boomer uh, episode. That was an event that the millennials took note of. Now, when marketing to this generation, you got to speak their language. Use text messaging. Use hashtags. They prefer the text messaging over emails. They prefer it over direct mail. That is the way they like to communicate, so you should be communicating with them that way. Uh, Use the hashtags. That's what they know. They like instant gratification, and they want everybody to win. So whatever you're offering them, please make it a win-win situation. Hey, guys, if you have any questions, you want to make any comments, I'd I'd love to add them to the show. Just email me at steve at rearrangingchange.com. And when we come back, our buddy, Ron Seggi. 
My friends, I'd like to offer you a free copy of my international best-selling book, Rearranging Change, How You Market to an Ever-Changing World. Just simply go to rearrangingchange.com. That's R-E-A-R-R-A-N-G-I-N-G-C-H-A-N-G-E.com. Rearrangingchange.com. I will pay for your book. You simply pay for the shipping and handling. Once again, a little gift from me. Rearranging Change, how you market to an ever-changing world. Go to my website, rearrangingchange.com, and get your free copy today. Welcome back. And I told everybody last week that they should go and hear my buddy, runsedgy.com, to hear his radio show. But you can also hear it on the USA Network on Saturday nights. But what I didn't tell you is you can also go and listen to him sing at sedgysings.com. Multi-talented, great friend. Please welcome Ron Sedgy. Hello, Ron. Hi, Hi, Steve. Thanks for having me back. It's always great being here, my friend. Hey, Ron, I I neglected to ask you last week. uh, And for those listeners who are listening on their headphones or while they're driving, you're not going to see this. But if you get a chance to go onto YouTube and watch this podcast, Ron is sitting at a very pretty interesting desk what is that you're sitting at well this desk is really uh, a very very close item to my heart it really is and first let me say that i will later on in the podcast back up the camera so you can see the whole thing but i'm a president's buff i have been a presidential kind of historian if you will for about 45 years. Nobody knows that about me. They know I'm a singer. They know I'm an announcer. They know that I collect cars. They know all of these things about me. What they don't know is I have a replica of the Oval Office in my home. And yeah, I yeah. love presidential <laughs> history. Well, that's, that's the thing. When if, if people watch this, they can see you have the American flag and you have the presidential flag and you look like you're sitting in the Oval Office. That's why I want to know about this desk. Well, excuse me, I'm getting a call on the red phone here, excuse me. (laughs) Putin just wanted to know if we were still on. Uh, (laughs) The desk is the Resolute Desk. The desk was first given to the United States by England in 1890. The little story behind it is that there were a couple of explorers that wanted to explore up around the North Pole from England. They got caught in an ice jam. They couldn't get their boat out, so they were rescued by another boat a few years later. America went up there. They rescued the boat. It was called the Resolute. That was the name of the boat. They brought it back to the United States, refurbished it in the early 1800s, gave it back to England as a token of appreciation and friendship. Well, around 1885, they decommissioned the ship, broke it up, and they made two desks. One went to the Queen of England, and one went to the President of the United States in 1890 in the White House. That desk has been in the White House since 1890, with the exception of a couple of years after John Kennedy was assassinated, and then they put it out on tour. Lyndon Johnson put it on a tour of memorabilia. This is the desk, if you remember, that little John John was coming out. Oh, yeah, the hole in the front. Desk, yes. And the reason that that little door was put on was back in the early 1940s to hide President Roosevelt's crippled legs and his braces. And uh, it's currently in the White House right now. Uh, uh, Donald Trump is using it. President Obama is using it. Uh, if it wasn't in the Oval Office, then it was in the family quarters. But it has been in the since 1890. And this is an exact replica of that desk that my, my wife actually gave it to me. And it's really a piece that will stay in our family for hundreds of years. Wow, it's beautiful. It really is. I, now, I got to tell you, as beautiful as that desk is, what I find to be really beautiful is that book that you've got sitting on top of that desk right now. It looks this very one? familiar. No, not that one. The one oh. on the other side. <laughs> oh, 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 this one. This one over here. Yeah. What's that one called? Uh, this is called, let me see. Uh, let, me, let me think. The, this is, of course, Rearranging Change, and it's done by the host of the show, Steve McChesney. Yay. My desk. I tell you where it sits, too. It sits right next to the story of the Resolute. Oh, wow. Okay, so it's got great company here. <laughs> and uh, this is a great book, of course. 
And this is this was not a plant. This is always on my desk, yeah. believe it or not. I, I love it. Thank you very much, Ron. And, and uh, you know, for those of you who get a chance, get to the YouTube so you can just take a look at this. It's absolutely beautiful. So, Ron, who did you uh, bring for us to listen to this week? Well, this is uh, one of several times that I interviewed this fellow. And he, in later life, became a little controversial, but he has mellowed over the years. Great, great journalist. And it's Dan Rather. Oh, yeah. CBS News. Uh, the first time I interviewed him, and it was for a book called uh, The Camera Has Eyes Too, or something to that nature. Sounds this like a horror movie. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, this particular interview centers around the fact that he was on the scene in uh, Delaney Park when uh, President Kennedy was assassinated. And it's a remarkable story of how he was right there. And uh, you'll get a little bit more of the gist of it when you hear the interview, but it's a fascinating story. This is what we call the backstory. Well, that's great. Uh, and w how appropriate to talk about your desk in that Oval Office today for that, yes. too. All and, right, well, and being the desk that was kind of really brought to the forefront with little John John coming out of that uh, front door. Yeah, amazing. Let's take a listen. We are doing a very special show this week as we remember the anniversary of President John F. Kennedy's assassination back on November 22nd of 1963. And I want to read you a letter. Dear Ron, I am grateful to you for your interview while I was promoting my new book, The Camera Never Blinks Twice. Thank you so much for making our interview so pleasant and productive. You and your team did a terrific job, and I truly appreciate your good efforts. Here's hoping our paths cross again soon. That was dated October 17th, 1994. That was signed by our guest, Dan Rather. Hi, Dan. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Aren't you kind to, to still have that letter? Wow. It's framed and in our studios here, and I'm so ecstatic that you're here today. And I must say that we got to quit meeting every 24 years. So There's got to be sooner than that, you know? I would totally agree with that. You are one of the first reporters that actually saw what happened that terrible day on November 22nd, 1963. A young reporter reporting from, of course, Dallas, Texas. Dan, what was it like when you saw that? Well, it's a never-to-be-forgotten day, to say the least. And uh, in fact, the whole weekend, what we call the four dark days in Dallas. Friday when the president was assassinated, Saturday when his assassin was being questioned by police, and then Sunday, incredibly, it's still kind of hard to believe, when the assassin was assassinated in the basement of the police station, and then, of course, on Monday, the national funeral led by the still grieving First Lady. It was an emotional earthquake for me as a person, as it was for every person in America and many people around the world. I was just past the school book depository waiting for a film drop of the motorcade. I didn't immediately realize that any shots had been fired. I didn't hear any shots. I didn't see any. But when the rest of the motorcade didn't follow behind the presidential limousine, I knew something was wrong. So I rushed back a few blocks to our local station from where we could broadcast. And by the time I got back there, it was obvious the president not only had been shot, but had been seriously hit. And I managed to get through to Parkland Hospital. And partly as a result of that, our CBS News team confirmed that the president was dead a number of minutes before the White House made the official announcement. You were not in the press motorcade, the pool car, were you? No, I was not. Uh, the late Bob Pierpoint was the CBS News White House correspondent. He was in the motorcade. My job as a young CBS correspondent, because I'd grown up in Texas, they assigned me to arrange the coverage. I didn't expect to be on the air that day, but I had arranged our coverage, you know, the getting the film from the motorcade, getting the film back, and having it processed. Keep in mind, we didn't have portable videotape in those days. Right. So that was my occasion of being in Dallas. I had organized the CBS News coverage for the trip to the state. Uh, as you know, you may remember the president had already gone to San Antonio, Houston, Fort Worth. He was in Dallas. Austin was to be the next and last stop. We had staffed up a bit in Dallas because we thought if there's going to be any trouble, we didn't really expect trouble. If there's going to be any trouble, it would be in Dallas. No one thought of an assassination, but Dallas was a citadel of resistance to desegregation and uh, racial justice. It was a, a, a citadel of resistance to the Kennedy administration and the Democratic Party. And there'd been some jostling of Democratic candidates before in Dallas, so we thought, well, we've, we should have a little bit heavier coverage in Dallas than anywhere else, which we did. Dan, how do you go from just covering this thing from a peripheral level 
to going from there to not only breaking the news prior to the White House breaking the news, called Parkland Hospital. You receive verification of the death of the president from a priest and an emergency room physician, and then later was shown the Zabruder film to bid on it for CBS News. I mean, those were two huge entries into the story. Well, that's true. Uh, again, I was a bit lucky that uh, I was among the first to see this Bruder film, and our team, including our local station, KOLD, had helped to find this Zabruder film and played a small role in getting the film processed. And then when they showed it to us, uh, what they did was uh, Mr. Spruder hired a lawyer who wanted to sell the film, and he said, look, we're going to show you this film once and one time only. So I saw it once, I left there immediately to go to describe from memory on the air what I had seen. So in that sense, yes, you know, it was a big story, and partly through luck and partly through experience, we did manage to get pretty much in the middle of it. Dan, how did you verify who you were, and why did they give you that information at Parkland Hospital? I mean, anybody could have well, called it. The chaos factor, like, first of all, because I called the hospital right away, I knew the hospital switch for you flooded if I didn't call right away. Because I called right away, the first time I called the switchboard operator hung up on me, This I called right back, got through, and just begged her to keep on the line. You don't want to un- underestimate the chaos factor. The hospital was completely mobilized. Remember, not only had the president been hit, but Texas Governor Conley had been hit. They were in a chaotic mood, and I somehow the switchboard operator took it on faith that I was who I said I was. I remember saying to her, you can call me back if you want to verify whom I am. And I begged her to get somebody, anybody on the phone who might be able to tell me what was going on, and she proved to be quite helpful. As you say, I talked to a doctor, talked to a priest, and at another place, another member of our team, Eddie Barker, who was the news director, talked to somebody who was high up in the hospital administration. All these people said, without equivocation, that the president was dead. So mm-hmm. I knew we were dealing with a dead president, even though the official announcement had not been made. What was the scene like when the limousine went past you? Did you see the president? Did you uh, see Clint Hill, Jackie, uh, Connolly? Well, I had no idea. I wasn't even sure it was the president's limousine. I get the picture. I'm there, just sort of waiting for the motorcade to come. Everything had been routine. Indeed, pretty good up to then. I wasn't expecting any limousine, but why I wasn't even sure it was the president's limousine. I thought it was, and I thought to myself, well, did I see the first lady in that car? Was that the limousine? Mm-hmm. I wasn't sure. It just all happened in nanoseconds. What I did know almost immediately after that vehicle left was that the rest of the motorcade wasn't coming. The motorcade had stopped, and at that moment, I had no idea what had happened, but I knew something had happened because the rest of the motorcade didn't come. And in charge of our coverage, I thought, I'm out of position here. I have no way to broadcast. Remember, this is 1963. Right. We didn't have cell phones, didn't have live coverage on the street, so I had to get back to the station only a few blocks away. And by the time I got back to the station, as I say, then and only then did I know that the shots had been fired at the president. I'm amazed at the fact and very interested that you believe with one gun, one shooter, Lee Harvey Oswald, acted alone. And that's interesting to me in lieu of all of the various theories surrounding this. Why do you feel that way? Well, uh, first of all, I think the facts uh, point in that direction. I want to make clear, I, I understand reasonable theories about how Oswald you know, couldn't have done it alone and reasonable theories about a possible conspiracy. I'm open-minded. I try to be, you know, fact concentrated and everybody's entitled to their own opinion about what happened but they're not entitled to their own facts now i think the facts strongly suggest i think beyond any reasonable doubt that oswald definitely was a shooter i do think Mm -hmm. there was one gun one shooter i think it was lee harvey oswald i consider the rosetta stone of the case the fact that he killed officer jd tippett a short time after he left the school book depository right i recognize that there are other people with other theories and maybe history will prove them right but we're years beyond the point now now so the second part will okay even if you accept as i do that oswald was probably the shooter and the only shooter and acted alone in shooting was somebody else part of a conspiracy that acted with him. It's more difficult in that area. Again, I'm open-minded. I still study the case. Nobody yet has given me what I consider to be persuasive evidence of a conspiracy. I do agree the Warren Commission didn't do its job perfectly. I think the process was flawed, but I think they reached the right conclusion. The FBI and the CIA withheld information from the Warren Commission, and that makes them somewhat under sufficient. But, you know, conspiracies are very hard to keep, and 
the idea that Oswald was somehow involved with somebody who put him up to this or helped him do it, I think is a reasonable hypothesis, but it is a hypothesis. Those who speculate that conspiracy involved tens, if not dozens, if not hundreds or thousands of people, the CIA, the FBI, Lyndon Johnson, the Defense Department, I don't think this is reasonable that that many people were involved in the conspiracy and the conspiracy could last this long. It's amazing how a tragedy sometime will spawn careers for other people. Well, that's true. And also, we remember, and we should, we're in the United States of America, where people are allowed to, to speculate and be skeptical or even cynical about what they're told by official sources. So no one should be surprised at this. He was only president for a thousand days. He was the first president born in the 20th century. He was the first Roman Catholic president. He represented new youth forward-looking, but because his presidency was so short, because he was assassinated, he died violently so young, there's always going to be mystery and mystique surrounding President Kennedy and his administration. Dan, do we have to wait another 20 years to get together again? I hope not. <laughs> uh, give me a call or send up a flare. I, I love talking to you and love to be on with you uh, with maybe a, a happier, more optimistic subject. So I look forward to it, and I very much appreciate you having me on today. Thank you, Dan. I appreciate your time, and I look forward to having you back, my friend. Thank you very much. Good luck and Godspeed. Thank you, Dan. Well, that was very fascinating with Dan Rather. And, you know, uh, back to sales and marketing, when he mentioned about the Zapruder film and how they sold that film, uh, what it was to the highest bidder, there were sales involved there, wasn't there? Oh, there's a lot of sales involved there. And it was amazing that uh, Zapruder had the wherewithal and the foresight not to take the first bid because that kind of money that they were offering at that time was a lot. And of course, you have to understand that you didn't know at that time if there was other footage that would be more valuable. I mean, later on, we found out that that was probably the most accurate description and viewing of what really happened compared to other shots that were kind of hit and miss, and a lot of them stills. But uh, if he would have that he uh, was only, rather than possibly thinking like today, if something, God forbid, happened in the you White House, two thousand angles. Copies of it. Yeah, yeah. He had the only angle, and, and he probably worth. Well, not probably. Definitely worth a whole lot more than he got for it. But sometimes you just gotta wait, right? Patience sometimes will pay off in the the long run. But in this case, it was not only the money, but it was history. And uh, right. you know, thank Dan rather for for bringing it to us. He, what a remarkable career he had. I mean, um, I remember him, of course, growing up on the CBS Evening News. I mean, he was the only person I knew, really. Dan Rather was, was the guy. But I didn't know about the stuff that he had done prior to that and how he, you know, the really an interesting thing is in Texas, he helped save 350,000 lives. Uh, there was an evacuation of Hurricane Carla. He was mm -hmm. on the news and he's the one that actually got people to move. You know, this guy's got a pretty good history. Well, and it's important to note that when he was covering that assassination that day and that arrival of the president in Dallas, he wasn't no anchor man. He was a what they call in the business a stringer. He was out there just to get some B-roll and maybe do a little voiceover once the B-roll was put on the air. But he was not the anchor man. I'll say at the time, and we all remember that clip, Walter Cronkite was. Right. I, I have a little piece of trivia though, he told me, and I don't know, can't remember if it was on the interview or not. But um, do you know who his wife used to date? Dan Rather's wife? Yes. Mm, I don't even have a good guess. Okay, well, when he told me, I said, wow. I said, that's quite some competition. You know, you'd be very cool with a cape on the 630 News singing hunk a hunk of burning love oh. because his wife used to date Elvis Presley. No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And she left him for Dan? Uh, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe Elvis left her. <laughs> well, yeah. Probably a little bit more. Who knows what happened there? What a great interview, though. And again, thank you for going into the vault. And um, we really appreciate it. I look forward to seeing what you bring us next week. Thanks, My friend, Steve. Ron Seggi. Remember me, ronseggi.com and also seggisings.com. Uh, go out by and uh, to pay a visit to my buddy. All right, folks. Thanks again for visiting. Got questions? You got comments? You got some things you want to hear? Send me an email, steve at rearrangingchange.com. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Rearranging Change. Make sure to visit my website, stevemcchesney.com. Sign up for my newsletter. We'll be talking soon.